But I want to tell you a little bit of a story. I was uh, raised in a very small rural community in Spartanburg, South Carolina, a little tiny hamlet in the northeastern part of Spartanburg County near the North Carolina border. It was a little hamlet, not really a town, but you would officially call it. It was a place where there was 100% African Americans and a very tiny, tiny, tight-knit community. It was founded by my great-great-grandfather, who was a freed slave. And he handed down that land to all of his descendants. And believe it or not, it's called Little Africa. And I'm very proud of the fact that it's called Little Africa. My parents are people who just went to high school originally, and they really tried to instill within their two boys the importance of education. So we didn't really have much in Little Africa, but we had really, really good schools. Now, my father didn't make it. He killed himself by shooting himself with a sawed-off double-barreled shotgun when I was 11 years old. But my mother was a very, very important part of my life and continues to be. And she later on went to college. It was the proudest moment of her life and one of the proudest moments of my life. And I'm very proud of my mother today. Now, 30 minutes away was our extended family. And I used to love to go there because we had the most amazing cousins. And one cousin in particular, I really, really was drawn to. I'll call him Terrell. Terrell was a very rambunctious kid. I really liked him because he used to always play all these games and he was always the leader, a little rough, especially when it came to my older brother. And I remember one time he went to their house and he just flew over the couch, attacked my brother and wrestled him to the ground for no reason whatsoever. And my mother used to always say, Terrell, that's a bad boy. Terrell's just bad. And my grandmother used to say, now, Terrell, you keep being bad, and I'm going to get my hickory. <laughs> now, I always thought Terrell was a pretty cool kid. Very smart, very inquisitive, very creative. But something happened when we both turned 18 years old. Now, keep in mind, we're only 11 months apart. I went to college. Terrell went to prison. Now, there are a lot of circumstances as to why that happened. Terrell made some very bad choices. But I truly, truly believe that sometimes, no matter how hard you try, the cards are stacked against you. I really, honestly, truly believe that. In this country, as we all know, three out of four African-American males, especially low income, will experience some form, some form of criminal justice supervision. And there are many reasons for that. For example, with Terrell and myself, my little elementary school was in the middle of a peach field. And our grade, our entire grade, was 15 people. So if I fell below the cracks, my teachers could pick me up and really focus on me and get me back on the path. Terrell went to a very crowded urban junior high school beside the projects. So, unfortunately, he got caught up in the criminal justice system and ultimately went to prison for robbery and assault. Now, what's also interesting to me, and this is what we need to really acknowledge, that if you're an African-American male in this country in particular, and you go into the criminal justice system, you are abandoned. And it makes life so much more difficult and your opportunities are limited. Now, this would be a surprise to Carlos Rosado. Carlos Rosado grew up in the South Bronx, got in trouble, was arrested for armed robbery himself, and sent to prison in New York State for 16 years. But Carlos discovered the Bard Prison Initiative. And while he was there, he earned an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. And today, Carlos is an engineer, He's a great member of his company, and he's a wonderful, solid member of his community. It costs the state of New York $54,000 a year to house him in a New York State prison. 
Today, Carlos makes $90,000 a year, and he is, in fact, a taxpayer. And I think that's really, really important. We often hear about the school to prison pipeline, but no one ever talks about the prison to school pipeline. And that's why it's so great to be here at Ironwood, because you have a high quality post-secondary program. Now, as you know, there's a dearth in correctional education programs all over the country. And it's mostly being funded by charities and foundations. The Ford Foundation is very proud that we fund 36 correctional programs across six states. When I came to the foundation three years ago, I was asked to rethink and redo the higher education program. So I went all over the country interviewing 326 people. I interviewed community college presidents, university presidents, members of higher education boards and commissions, legislators, governors, I had student groups and parents groups. And we were trying to figure out what could Ford's added value be. And in fact, it turns out that a lot of foundations were not putting money into very challenging populations such as immigrants and veterans and those who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. But this should be no surprise to you that the Ford Foundation has invested in correctional education. For nearly 77 years, the Ford Foundation has been at the forefront of the civil rights movement, supporting legendary struggles for self-determination and freedom for the most disenfranchised people all over the world. And we're very proud of that. I went to 28 prisons interviewing people, and I didn't meet a single person who didn't want to turn their lives around. But we know the reality. 600,000 people actually come out of prison every year, and we know that two-thirds recidivate after three years. You know, there's an old saying, we all know what I'm about to say, and that is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, as you all know, our criminal justice system is broken. But it doesn't have to be that way. We posit a number of questions at the Ford Foundation. What ifs? What if, in fact, you go beyond the bare minimum of providing people in prison with a basic education and provide them with a high quality post-secondary education, much better than they ever had when they were kids? What if, in fact, you created innovative college programs in every single jail and every single prison all over America, all over America, so that you can, in fact, turn car thieves and robbers and drug dealers into engineers and entrepreneurs who can take their critical thinking skills to solve the most vexing problems in America, including mass incarceration and breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty. What if, in fact, we use those resources that we use today to build more prisons and also to pay companies to run prisons, to divert those resources to be put into the prisons that focus on technology and knowledge so that when they get out, they can be prepared for the 21st century? And what if, instead of looking at prisons as a revolving door of punishment, we saw prisons as an on-ramp of opportunity so that our communities can be renewed all over this country. <laughs> Let me tell you this. This is not just an issue of will. This is an issue of systems and policy change. We can hear it all over again, over and over and over, about the 10 steps. But the real issue is really being focused on how we work with policymakers, community-based organizations, local and state officials to change the policies that have resulted in what we have today in our criminal justice system. Our criminal justice system is broken. But education is so important because it allows you to explore who you are, to find out who you are, and to make new discoveries. 
One of my favorite poems is A Little Getting by T.S. Eliot. We shall never cease from exploration. And at the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we've started and know the place for the first time. As you are in your educational experiences here at Ironwood, think about that, how education can be a wonderful opportunity for exploration and discovery. One of my favorite people in the world is Doris Buffett, sister of Warren. She funds programs like this all over the country, including the fabulous program Hudson Link at Sing Sing. And Sean Pico, we're very happy today, is here. We founded that program. And Doris called me up one day. She said, Doug, will you come to graduation at Sing Sing? Now look, when Doris Buffett calls, you say yes, but at the same time, I want to know what was going on up there. And I said to Doris, well, what time do I meet you? And she said, meet us out in front of the big house at 6. <laughs> and we went there, and it was absolutely wonderful. And the reason why it was so wonderful was because I heard the best valedictorian speech I've ever heard in my life. Victor Anderson, whose father was also incarcerated. And this is what he said. Look around you. You will see us again. You will see us in the communities. You will see us in the workplace. You will see us in PTA meetings. You will see us at civic centers. You will see us in board meetings. You will see us at Yankees games and Knicks games with our children and our family and our wives. But most important, you will see us as productive citizens. I absolutely love, love, love that quote. Now I want to turn back to my cousin Terrell. What of Terrell? Well, today he finished his GED. He's now on the road to getting an associate's degree at a technical college. And he sees now the power of education. So guess what? He's not bad. He's not bad at all. He's me. He's you. He's all of us who see education as transformative, as reinventing, and as redemption. And so I say to you today, I have not given up on my cousin. America shouldn't give up on my cousin. America shouldn't give up on any of you, and America shouldn't give up on any of us. Thank you. Thank you.